archives, talking about uh, how the archive materials in you can use in your works. You will learn about it. Now, Michal, the floor is yours. Hello. I will tell you today how to make uh, free war movies and how you, the such um, archival um, and old materials can still be uh, screened and how can you uh, they, they can reach you as the audience because the most important thing is how uh, that, that that you can see those movies recently there has been a lot of talk about the uh, cgi rec the digital reconstructions or digital works related to to films and this is what i would like to tell you more about what it looks like in case of those oldest films because this is a work which is slightly different than in case of newer movies and the newer movies are the movies which are post the newer movies are the post war movies for us you're talking about the, we're talking about this the digital reconstruction but people do not really know what it's all about and which works are related to that especially that in case of uh, mm, of movies that we have a lot of more work and a lot of mo more stages of work all starts uh, from the work with the um, with the tape uh, we have quite a big collection in Poland of uh, Polish and international movies all on the original pre-war um, films that were used in the 1940s, 30s or even earlier. They were present in movies. Uh, they are in very, in various conditions, in very different con condition. Quite usually they can't be used anymore. You can't just put them on the projector because they would not survive that and they would not be useful anymore. As you can see that they are quite often really, really used up. An element of the, the perforation is, is the part which is more susceptible to destruction. This is the element of the tape which is responsible for the fluid and fluent transfer of this of this uh, mm, film in in equip in the equipment, where it's uh, copying machines or projectors or cameras. We had those this perforation so that this tape could be moved flu fluidly fluidly through the machine. Um, so the the cogs would would pull these would pull these perforations perforations through and these perforations were more susceptible to damage because of that. You can see that you have we have a lot of missing links here on the top. In on you can you can't see any of that because it fell out totally. And this can't be used in any way. You can't work with it. Uh, you can't put it on a projector. You can't put it on a copying machine. You can't put it on a scanner because first of all. Uh, the risk is that though the, 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 the can be, there can be more damage, this tape would be subject to further destruction. So all these missing li elements have to be repaired and the, the, it has to be, be prepared to go to the scanner or some other equipment. Another quite often, uh, the damage which we can see quite often are the breaks in the, um, in the film. The, if we have this tape which has some missing, uh, the, missing links for example it can be broken in the machine this breakage unfortunately is not the very big unfortunately some have have the tendency some films have the tendency to break along the line of the film and quite often it happens that over several meters we have the the tape broken in two and gluing something thing like that this is this is a nightmare of a conservationist uh, but we also deal with situations like that Another problems we have when we have such tapes is are they just pure, just dirty. In old times, the projectors had to be oiled a lot so that all moves fluidly and nothing nothing works badly and nothing breaks down. Quite often they were over oiled and the uh, s surplus of this oil was left on the film. On the you you got sticky oil mm, elements and then it was covered with filth. And after many years of exploitation, such were such t tape is so filthy that you can't work with it anymore because you can't uh, you can't um, repair anything uh, which is so dirty with oil. First of all, you have to initially clean the tape in, in order to be able to glue it together or repair it because such oil uh, oily tape will not cooperate. A very important characteristic of the pre-war films is that what they were made out of different materials than later initially because from the beginnings of the kinematography from the 19th and 20th century until 1950s 
the most of often used material was nitrocellulosis. It was the first plastic which was uh, el which was uh, mm, elastic. It was transparent and it was very good for use of film tape. There were other plastics too, but they were usually n uh, opaque or brittle or not uh, flexible. Nitrocellulosis was the first plastic that was good for th that was a good thing for the good material for the. Uh, uh, for uh, film, but it was very unstable chemically. It was if it was stored in wrong conditions, quite easily it degraded, and this is what happened with it. Additionally, the uh, the light sensitive emulsion in, in which the uh, image was inscribed was based on gelatin. As you probably can imagine, gelatin is quite susceptible to um, uh, to humidity, and if we if we have humidity and the wrong conditions of storage, you get microbiological attacks you get a lot of like fung fungi and molds on this and this this gelatin is just tasty for them and they eat up the gelatin and the effect is as you can see here this image is getting blurred it disappears this is not only the blurred from water that it was smeared out it is the effect of uh, chemical um, uh, reactions microbiological attacks and different m microorganisms are just eating up our um, gelatin. This is what it looks like in the close-up. This is from the film Mr. Tadeusz from the 1938. During the f the destruction was so high that, that only the eyes of Gervas were left and, and a piece of the, of the, the door frame. Unfortunately, this uh, this is what the film pre-war film behaves like, um, like that. It all depends, of course, on the conditions of storage, but unfortunately they are susceptible to such processes. So you have to, first of all, protect them especially protect them and then check every now and then if something's happening with them and if you look see anything like that on the label this is for us our for us is an alert that you have to copy this or, or scan it or in any other way uh, secure it because this film will stop will cease to exist another level of degradation of this uh, tape is that n the, the the basis, the, the foundation, the ni nitrocellulosis gets into chemical reaction with the light sensitive emulsion and uh, the mm, as the effect we get the um, effect of fading away and you can see that the in the you can see that in the center the image is still pretty well seen but at the edges it's it, it got it faded away. The nitrocellulosis the nitrocellulosis becomes sticky and brittle at the same time. What you can see here is the result of brittleness of and what got g got torn away here is the result of this tape being put on a roll and the you can see that the, the, this tape got st stuck to one to to itself. So this tape becomes very very sticky. The last element of degradation of uh, nitrocellulose is that it turns into dust. You get uh, like a like a rust colored dust similar to uh, potato uh, potato mm, uh, flour and it's very detrimental to health and very smelly. So at the end of the day all those all those um, tapes will end up like this. You can't stop those processes you can slow them down by p protecting by uh, storing by the right storage conditions that's why it's very important for us to monitor in which conditions this these tapes are secured and if nothing wrong is happening for them because we are racing against time another feature of the order characteristic of those old tapes which makes it very difficult to work with such tapes is that unfortunately they they, st they shrink as nitrocellulosis which also as a uh, as an effect of chemical reactions it shrunk but it shrunk in different ways in different directions sometimes uh, perpendicular sometimes horizontal and not in a uniform way uh, unfortunately in one place you could uh, get it shrunk uh, much more and the in another one it, it it got shrunk in much less ways and what you can see here is a very shrunk place this is one of the extreme cases from our collection this is a comedy about uh, a, a comedy from 1933, a great film, but working on this was a real, a real tragedy because you can imagine a roll of a film. It should be ideally round. When this is so wavy, you can see that it looks like this. I hope that you can see it. 
it, it looks like a cauliflower. You can't put it evenly on the walls. It was so shrunk that even on within on within the space of one frame, it could be it it couldn't be straightened out. It it could not go through the scanner. We were not able to scan it because it was so deformed that we couldn't manage to do it. This is the close-up for for one of the fragments of that um, of that tape. It uh, you can see it, but it got shrunk much more in the center and much less in the uh, at the edges. So it's almost almost flat in the in the middle, but the edges are wavy. And really, it's very difficult to do anything like that with a tape like that. The biggest problem, however, when it comes to nitrocellulosis and the pre-war tapes, is that nitrocellulosis was a, an extremely flammable material. You've probably heard quite often that there were um, fires, uh, for example, in the the the. the the Inglorious Bastards, you could see that in a very spectacular way. Uh, the films were extremely flammable, and if nitrocellulosis got a flame, got, get, got a fire, you cannot extinguish it. Uh, it has to burn at, and it, uh, until it will burn out. This is a film made by our friends from British uh, Film Archive. Here is how nitro... Uh, you can see we set that on fire. Here it's you can s we try to we try to extinguish it and you can see that we extinguish the fire but there's still something happening we're trying to extinguish it once again but it's still fuming and then what you see you can see what's happened this just burns and you cannot stop it from burning it will burn and it will end burning because it, it, it will it will not take much time it, it burns very intensively much faster than the than paper and with a lot of energy. It's not an explosion, but not much short of ex an explosion. This is a, a small form, a s small roll of a tape, and you can see how big is this flame. So after a few minutes, it burns out, but uh, within a few minutes, you know, the damage can be catastrophic, and these there were plenty of uh, problems like that. And if, uh, apart from um, the rolls, also the walls of the cinema took fire, then you could imagine what would happen. Another example how the nitro tape could uh, could burn, and this is very spectacular. Let's 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 set it on fire and put it in the water. As you can see, it burns even underwater, and this is because when some anything is burning and we want to dampen it, we can we can dampen it with the water with putting. Uh, I don't know, a blanket over it. Uh, it, it, everything is about cutting off the cutting off the uh, oxygen through water or sand or blanket or cutting off the, the oxygen. How unfortunately nitrocellulosis has a lot of, of oxygen in its uh, construction, in its structure, and it, bu it doesn't need atmosphere for that. It burns even under underwater, and it shows, just to show you what are the attempts of um, putting out the fire of nitro tape, it just doesn't work. So you can say, I in a way, sometimes going at some point uh, in history, going to, to the cinema was an extreme sport because that could get self inflamed. It was self inflaming even at 40 degrees centigrade. This could happen. And you have to remember that film projectors had very strong lamps because the source of light had to be strong enough to, to get it through the room on the big screen like that, or even bigger film screen, to get a very good and precise image, this lamp had to be very, very strong. And these projectors were heating up very quickly. So at the, as a result of this of this temperature, um, fires did happen. Only in the 1950s, the nitro tapes were um, removed, th they were pulled out because of safety reasons. New plastics were developed, which were used in film, uh, in production of uh, film tapes, and in the 1950s, officially, um, officially, yeah, the, the they were pulled out in 1950s because they it, it did not have happen unofficially uh, uh, in the U.S. But in the uh, in the Soviet Union, the nitro tapes were still used until 1960s. Mm. 
so when we go through all this restoration works when those tapes are cleaned repaired and prepared or to to be digitalized or used in any other way th that's where when digitalization starts digitalization is moving something transferring something from from a physical form to a digital form every single every single frame scanners are quite big so it, it's it's a bit a bit Mm, about the size of a wardrobe. The scanners are very different. The scanner that you can see right now, this is the, I can boast this is the first scanner of such, um, of, of its sort in Poland. It was the first Polish scanner uh, adapted for scanning the oldest, the most fragile film films, and it's a very delicate machine. It does not pull the the tapes too much. It doesn't. It use uses the mm, the cogs and the uh, preparations in a minimal way to be so that we can scan it in the safest way and thanks to the scanner a big part of our pre-war collection was scanned and we're still working on that because this work is going on and they still take place when frame after frame we scan that such film um, this tape of course can be checked if nothing bad happened with such tape after we check it we put it back to the archive where it's s stored in a safe conditions and any further work takes place in the digital form and this is what here what happens what the average vi viewer understands as a digitalization in the pre in terms of after war tapes uh, um, the, the 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 situation is much better with those with those tapes they are much in mu much better conditions we had this good uh, we had this good um, uh, situation that after the war almost everything was saved by the state in official archi archives so we had we have backup or we have movies like films after the war they are stored mm, in safe conditions and w working with them is pretty comfortable the pre-war ones are m much overused they are incomplete the war has taken it its toll so working on the oldest movies oldest polish movies is a, a lot more work a lot more challenges even though that these are different type of work than those who were made after the war. So let's say we have this film scanned and we're starting the, the work on restoring such such an image. Th there's been a lot of talk about the reconstruction of such movies and I wanted to explain the difference between the restoration and reconstruction because in Poland these two um, uh, terms are mixed in Poland. Reconstruction is for the films which are incomplete or in several incomplete versions or in some non-original versions and they require some intervention in the story reconstruction is reconstruction restructuring rebuilding of the movie uh, in a situation we can see there's something wrong with the film that it requires some additional work and the restoration work is what in the majority is happening in case of films it's work on the purification of the film and preparation uh, uh, removing the patina and the um, damage um, so usually when, when we talk about the films the, the post post war film we it's they are usually re uh, restored they are they are usually complete you do not have to change anything in them in pre-war films now this is where the where the where the fun starts i will show it to you based on the film the call of the sea it's a polish movie it's a silent film 1927 several years we've been working on the reconstruction and restoration of this film we have two copies surviving to our days both are incomplete this is one of them a copy in the polish language which looks like this just after it leaves the scanner this is what it looks like unfortunately this uh, tape this uh, tape is incomplete and this movement is jerky uh, we miss certain fragments of this uh, tape fortunately we have two different copies of that movies surviving to our time and each of them is incomplete but each of them is incomplete in a different way in in different stages and in different places so we are able to supplement those m missing parts or parts of those missing parts after all this re restoration all this conservation work all the preparation uh, for the scanning we have the scan of the first one and the second copy we com we synchronize it in such a way that in ev at every moment 
we can see exactly the same frame on the screen. If something is moving, we put in the black, uh, <coughs> the black frame, but we synchronize these images so that we can see how they supplement one another. And this is what it looks like. You can see that in one window or the other window something is missing, but thankfully it's usually so that it's either it you have a um, no image in one and or the other and not in both. So thankfully we know how it we might uh, supplement one from another. Now we have to decide which of those images will be the basis for our re reconstruction and which one will be the supplementary material. So what we did, we took the Polish version and we accepted this as a as the as the basic version because it's colored as you can see it's slightly violet the other one is black and white and this violet here is not um, it, it was it was an artistic um, method which was used during the um, era epoch of the silent c cinema uh, there were colors or hues put on the film this is not the effect that I don't know it it, it became violet out of uh, old t old age it was made on purpose and not many silent films were black and white Bl black and white films ma in majority were colored and these colors were lost in f later years i will come back to that topic however this uh, huge uh, version was taken as a base and the black and white version was accepted as a supplementary material so we put it next to each other so that st so in order to supplement the missing versions from the later versions and this is what it looks like now as you can see you can see the violet uh, image with black and white uh, inserts and the quality is changing because they have like different type of 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 this of of missing parts and on end of damage the differences are m a lot but at least we have a very fluid movement and this take is already quite complete or as complete as it is allowed by our available material so you can see here is the reconstruction only when we uh, get this all together and we have the full version to the extent that is allowed by the available material that's when the re uh, digital restoration starts the stabilization removing of all the scratches etc A very important thing in in combining all the all those versions is the quality. The we always based ourselves on copying the movies. If we had, let's say, a, a pre-war copy of, of some movie which is easily flammable, flammable, it had to be copied to to new carriers and versions which could be shown in cinemas or TV or whatever. Unfortunately. In the analog world, every copying caused a certain loss of quality because it was like making a, a picture of a picture. Every next generation of the movie was a derivative material, less contrast, uh, mm, uh, lower sharpness and quality. So you can see here is the comparison of the materials. What you can see here is the later copy, several generations later, the sort of show copy made on save tapes and here you can see the scan from the pre-war nitro copy you can see the difference with the naked eye you you see a lot more details maybe not on this screen but you can believe me but there's a lot the quality is much better for example look at this belt you can see that this is a, this is a, a, a braided uh, cord in here you can see just white belt in here you can see the the woodwork here not there not here you can feel the s see the texture of the dress and there you have only black you can see the black uh, just a black dress uh, so it's much the, you, the differences in quality between what we knew so far this um, show copies and what you can get from the sc scans from original pre-war tapes if they survived until our days the difference is really immense and it's it shows you that it's worth to make those to, to perform that works even though that the tapes are so dis destroyed and damaged as y as you've seen as i've showed you the effect despite those the damage is much better in the quality is much so much better and in the such a sharp image it's be much better to work if you're removing any sort of uh, blemishes or damage in the best scans uh, you can see much more so when we're working on su such a film we can see certain interesting details here's one of my favorite it's a film called Yaja. It's a very 
funny com uh, musical comedy from 1936. The owners, the, the, the protagonists are owners of a sports shop. They usually work in with tennis equipment. And in the copy we all knew, uh, one of the protagonists was reading a newspaper. In the pre-war uh, table, when we scanned it, you could see, uh, you could augment this and could see exactly what he was reading. So you can see that he was reading the Przegląd Sportowy, the sports review. That I managed to find this newspaper. It was number 55 from 1936. And here we have two interesting facts. First of all, we know exactly when this newspaper was published that he's reading, so we knew uh, when those scenes were shot, so we can establish how much the production took. We knew when the premiere took place, we knew when the scene was shot, so that tells us a bit more about the, pr the production of this film. And another very interesting detail is that Anglia Podziwia Jędrzejowska, the Anglia uh, is in awe of Jędrzejowska. Jędrzejowska was the, uh, an absolute, absolute um, champion of, uh, of female uh, tennis before the, pre before the war. He got all the possible awards. And the Yadja, who was the main protagonist of the film, is the reference to Jadwiga Jędrzejowska. And one of the, one of the protagonists of, the m of this movie, who is also called Yadja, is called Jadwiga Jędruszewska. And she's a tennis player. So Jadwiga Jędruszewska from the movie is an absolute reference to Jadwiga Jędrzejowska, who was known by everybody in Poland and in Europe. And additionally, we have here this uh, sports review where we have Jadwiga Jędrzejowska on the front page. So this is a reference to the movie story. An additional detail, interesting detail um, um, or trivia we can talk about because in the copy that was known so far, you would not be able to see that interesting element. Yadja yeah, yeah, included also other interesting uh, elements and at the end of one of the few last shots you can see a, a guy a guy who's who's um, the, the clicker and this is of course a, a mistake in addition because something like that should not appear in the movie Th that that should be shortened but it wasn't and that wa that was um, uh, th that's uh, that's a mistake that appears in the films quite often. Here we have a young forest from 1936. You can see that this is a scene of the meeting in the school. Uh, you can see the same person, the, the slate guy, uh, who's in there. You can see that among those young boys. And such scenes with the with the slate are quite often in the Polish uh, movie. So when we're working on the reconstruction of such film, what should we do with it? And should we intervene? Because this this is like editing mistake, absolutely. So we could be tempted to remove those few, mm, those few um, frames, but our idea is not to improve it, is to uh, restore it to the original conditions, warts and all. This is a mistake, but this it's not our error. It's the error of the pre-war editors. And I believe that uh, such mistakes should be exposed because the mistakes that w we see in the films, they also tell us something about the production of those movies. Basing on such mistakes, you can really learn a lot in which conditions the films were made in those times. To what people mm, paid a lot of attention and watch what they didn't pay attention to. And it's uh, also great fun if I you have a huge fun club specializing in looking for goofs in the movies in current times, we shouldn't be worse with the pre-war films. And you can you can really learn a lot of interesting stuff. This also tells us a lot about the performance of this movie, and I really hope that somebody from the filmmakers or historians would also devote some time to the mistakes of pre-war movies, and they will be able to uh, come up to some interesting conclusions uh, in uh, related to their film. If we, as the restorators, we would improve that, you would not see that as the audience. And that's not what we had in mind. What, what we really want to do is to bring those films to the pr to their previous uh, form. If there's some, there are some errors, there is something wrong, there are some glitches. We have to keep that because that's an element of the history of our cinema. The fact that such things um, took place in the cinema tells us something. That 
the, the fact that you can understand every word in those movies despite despite all the noise etc it also tells you something about the act actors and about sound engineering of those times because in in modern times not everything is so well um, discernible i think that these mistakes is a very are, are a very inter interesting research material be, be and i think they should be left there because it's a part of the of those times i hope that you agree with me during comparison of different versions of the tones we also happen to stumble upon other um, surprises the differences between different versions of the tone sometimes the, the differences are only in the language version here we have the daughter of general of general pan kratov two copies of this film survive to this day we have the, the original polish version and uh, retrieved in the 1960s in Bucharest, the version with the Romanian um, subtitle. A special one is is the comedy the Two Joannas in from 1936. That's the only Polish sound uh, sound uh, film which uh, which we retained with two language versions and subtitles. It also shows that those films were screened um, uh, abroad it, during the communist times uh, everybody said that before the war nobody was interested in Polish films but when we an analyze certain copies from our uh, archives you can immediately see that they must have been shown abroad because we have copies with the uh, um, subtitles in, in various languages and putting subtitles on the film at that time was not so easy it's not that you have you can do it digitally you had to make a separate copy and press the by well not by hand but it was a machine but you you made it frame by frame you had to produce a copy that was cost nobody would take such cost just like that if such a copy was produced that meant that this film was distributed also abroad in many countries and these copies are a proof that polish films were going abroad and had certain popularity there we're going back to the daughter of general pankrato from the 1934 you have the original polish version with the polish <coughs> beginning and the romanian version the films were translated also not only had the subtitles they had dubbing and the example of such um, dubbing are sh the, um, the, the the version of the film of the film the, the, of this film was tr translated into German dubbing is even more costly than making uh, subtitles so these films had to be popular abroad if you look our if you look also at the international film press of those times you can see there are plenty of good reviews of, of Polish movies when one one when uh, my friend from the archives, uh, my colleague from the archives, uh, made a research in the um, American archives, we um, we found out with surprise that in those times that we were sending more films in the U.S. Uh, per annum than today, and they had really good reviews there, not reviews only <laughs> only in the Polish uh, weeklies, because w w which said that everything that's Polish is absolutely the best, but they had great reviews, for example, in New York Times. So this shows not only that these films are, were not as bad as people would say until recently, but that they, they were screened outside of Poland. And these versions in different languages are the proof of that. And thanks to the fact that we're reaching to those oldest versions, that we find those copies that have been incomplete and unused for many years, and they haven't been shown anywhere, we can uh, uncover the most interesting story of those films and this also leads us to new traces which then can be researched and checked and to some extent we are rewriting again the, the, the history of Polish cinema and it's a great satisfaction for us however there is one more thing because not only differences between those copies uh, they are not just copies in terms of language version of course dubbing uh, or uh, or s different language versions are a problem when we combine these two elements. What happened, what what we found out is that the, the in in case of one of those films, some parts of the films were only found only in the in the version with the with the language uh, with language uh, with the subtitles, and we tried to get rid of it, but we couldn't manage it, and um, we would have to reanimate that film. We we tried it; it didn't work out. 
we came back to the version with the, with the subtitles and if you look mm, at our restored version of two Johannas, in several moments in the film you can see languages into versions this is how we left it because we decided it's better to, for it to be a, a full shot with full sound and uh, i mean it's better if it's if it's full than um, uh, and the subtitles do not mess up with the reception so much here you have two totally different versions of the same film it's a silent film from 1920s a patriotic drama 19 sorry 1863 uh, based on the the truthful river by Zeromski. Um, it's a very famous polish novel i will show you the comparison of two films i will show it to you twice during the first moment i wanted you to concentrate on what's happening here on the, during the second uh, f uh, screening see at the right side on the screen and see how much it, it differs And once more. So we have two versions here, and we're trying to do something with it. What what can we do with it? It's a real problem because it doesn't work together. So when we find a situation like this, we have to um, establish two things. What's dif what's different? That's one thing, and the second one, why it is different. And now that th that is a much more difficult thing to establish. And w however, once we're able to establish why it is different, then we c we can agree uh, to which of these versions sh should be restored which one of them is original, which one of them is later. One of them has to be, there is always a risk that both of them are changed and from the later moment. And after doing mm, a lot of research and studying the materials, we, it, occur, it occurred that what we saw on the left hand side was the original version from 1921. 20, Ten years later, due to the anniversary of the um, uh, January up uprising, because everything that happened in this movie was during the January uprising, it was reintroduced to the screen. So it was, so the, the however, it was already the, the, the era of the um, film with sound. So it was already obsolete, the technology itself. So it has to be um, enriched. First, it was enriched by adding those effects, those um, fade in, fade out, fade out. You could see that the, there was a writing which was I imposed on the screen, which was not practiced in the 1920s yet. The colors in both versions were very different. In the original version, the colors, there were only three colors in the film. In the later version, there were several colors and they were used in a, in a totally chaotic and hapless way. I've mentioned to you about the, the, the colors, so now let me elaborate. The colors were used in the film <laughs> for two reasons. First of all, to pump up the drama of the story and to uh, underline the character of individual um, shots, but also to allow the viewer to understand in which scenery 
a given scene takes place. In the times when the because the colors that you can see that here were added in post productions and the film was black and white and only then individual scenes were uh, painted but uh, the uh, the films of that time were so insensitive that it was impossible to make night scenes so the night scenes were shot in the full sun during the day and that might be a bit strange that we have a an action which takes place during the night and you can s see the shadows of the protagonist on the on the pavement so you had to do something to give the uh, allow for the for the audience to understand that it's night and it, they made it during with a, with a blue light with blue hue this is done as as well in the theater you put the blue light on and everybody knows that it's night so in the films the blue color was like a, a an eye wink that let's agree that it's night other colors were used too for example uh, outdoors were you were done with a yellow hue some dramatic scenes could be red the night scenes were blue and these colors were underlining the drama of the situation or the, the or the, the the situation but that was used only uh, when there was there was no sound and the films were only black and white because if if again this um, if uh, the hue was put on the on the tape that would decrease the quality of the sound so then the films were not um, uh, later of course the the normal color films were uh, appeared and uh, color films started to be made what happened here is well, that was a, a silent film remade in the beginnings of the uh, of the uh, sound movies uh, the, the, these colors were like just for effect and without any idea whatsoever thanks to that we've managed to locate that this is a later version and the other one was the first version so we could restore the original version if you managed to see that film s um, published on dvd because we published on dvd you would see the original version that's an additionally interesting part because this original version was not known it was it was found fairly recently over over the last se several years only the later version was was known so what <coughs> what the effect is when the historians of uh, cinematography were look watching that film, they weren't, they weren't watching that film. They were watching this far-fetched remake done by nobody knows who. And it's difficult to judge such a film if we're dealing with a material which, is, which strays so much from the original material. It was even worse that nobody even realized that we are not dealing with the original. Only when the original tape was discovered, we could compare the, the differences and uh, decide where did it come from. So over the last years, the mm, opinion about the, the film 1863 could be much distorted. And this applies actually, unfortunately, to many of Polish pre-war films because um, until today, the filmmakers and other people who watch those films were not conscious of what we are watching, which version of the movie it is, uh, whether it's original or censored, or is it prepared for the American market, which uh, likes to change a lot in those films. There was no conscience, no awareness of what we're watching. So today, quite a, a widespread practice is that if you restore and r uh, reconstruct a movie, in the beginning, you see the um, the description of what you are going to watch and what what we did with that material, with the original material, so that you, as the audience, you can be aware what you are actually watching. These are very complicated works, quite uh, time-consuming, and you might ask, what next? No, sorry. Before that, before that question, just one more question before that, concerning restoration of the image. Because what I told you is, is the reconstruction, combining films from different versions, uh, returning to the original version and working on the continuity uh, of the narrative. But there's also restoration of the image and of sound. And this is much more often performed in with the images in the digital version. This is also what is done in pre with pre-war films. We have digital tools for removing different forms of damage and blemish. There is not no one program, no one software for mm, re restoring. But you do different things with with white 
scars, which you can see here. Oh, the other one uh, work with granularity. The other w uh, other software allows us which r to remove big <coughs> damage and blemishes. So this software for we have, a, for example, software for masking such white lines. You c we have uh, see an image here. You can see white lines through the whole. Uh, you have like black line here, uh, two black lines here, especially better seen uh, against the backdrop. And we starting the machine that removes those lines. And this is what we get at this end result. We do not have those two th those white lines. However, look what's happened. What happened again? Look at the masts. Unfortunately, the computer is a stupid equipment. They do not understand. It does not understand what to do. You just you have to set the tasks and you have to be very precise in setting the task so that the computer does it. Here, you had to remove the vertical lines, and what did they do? It it removed the vertical lines. Then you have to go back. You have to change the parameters, and if you you don't manage to do it, you have to mark the areas where the tool cannot mm, interfere with the image. In this case, or the case of this film, we had plenty of those cases. <coughs> and we had plenty of situations when we had uh, lines like uh, ropes, uh, um, planks, and masts, and we had a lot of problems with the software uh, because it was all removed. We have other... Um, we have other software which works pretty well with y m removing small blemishes, uh, and it works like this, that basing on, on the previous two frames, it restores what's happening there. So let's say we have something like a dirty here, the two previous uh, frames are analyzed. If you don't have it there, you can uh, fill it up basing on the, uh, on the previous two frames. This tool does not work well either. There were plenty of problems with that movie, you know, the waves are different in every frame. And when this equipment for removing that those uh, dark spots started to, I mean, they started to interfere with the waves and horrible things happened. And we have to set up, we have to mark all the, the huge parts on, of the uh, sea because there were such huge changes to and, and crazy results that you could not watch it. It was unwatchable. Th this is the Polish super production from 1928, Mr. Tadeusz. Unfortunately, the tape was degraded in many places very strongly. The emulsion is unfortunately fading away. So we have the here we have um, the scene of attack on Sopliczowo, and big portions were destroyed by the degradation. Unfortunately, it doesn't look as bad on the on other. Um, on other frames, so algorithms recreated that image here. But look at this horse, for example. It does. It is a bit blurred, and his legs are in the wrong place. Unfortunately, if we have within a frame a lot of movement, where in two other frames this horse has legs in a different place, you do not have a lot of material to draw from. And this is what th these are the distortions that take that appear. These digital distortions that say that are called artifacts, and digital artifacts, unfortunately, you can see that in this one frame. But when in several other frames, these artifacts are there, and each of them is different, this really gets in the way of watching the film. It draws your attention, and you can see it immediately. And uh, you stop focusing on the movie; you start to focus on uh, on the digital artifacts. So sometimes it's better to leave some big piece of destroyed, even though that it is big, then it allows you to a fluid movement of the image. It's better to leave it than to have some strange, weird things happening in the image, which is restored. Another example from Mr. Tadeusz, Grwazy is almost gone, and the computer restored Grwazy for us. But again, the leg of Grwazy which is in the front is a bit strange, a bit elephant-like. This is another digital artifact. So you, we had to go back after several unsuccessful attempts. We had to get back to the original uh, version and to leave the destroyed part as it was. Another interesting moment from the same scene from Mr. Tadeusz. We have a, a 
bleaked uh, a faded uh, image. Here again, the the leg of this horse disappears somewhere in the, in the middle. This guy does not have face. His uh, half of his head was eaten out. And these are the problems that we have to deal with. And should be told, when we talk about uh, this the working with those oldest titles, the restorers, restoration work consists in controlling and monitoring what those d digital tools do, because they do a lot of work for us. But as I mentioned, the uh, computer is stupid and it does not understand what they're doing. So each phase, each use of such tool has to be tested with a human being and see if there are, there are no mistakes which which uh, appeared there. And you will s very often you have to do it anew and anew, changing the parameters with a different tool. This is a very, it is a lot of work. And quite often these uh, films require that work and they're worth it, I, I believe. And here we come to the next uh, question. Is it worth devoting so much time to those films and do people need to watch such old films? Yes, they do. And here, here is a movie um, made in Pordenone, a festival of silent cinema, the biggest one in the world. Uh, what, what you see here is the queue to the screening of our pre-war movie, Johnny the Fiddler. Uh, the interest was extremely uh, high. Uh, there were almost full room, like 900 people watching that film. And yes, there are still people who want to watch movies from before the war. And it's worth working on them be because only in the restored digital version we can present these films to you, and you can be and you can enjoy those films and appreciate them. So I think it's worth it. And here we approach the second part of our today's meeting. What else you can do with those movies when we complete these works? They have to be made available, made available to you. And I want to tell you how we made those films available to you in our mm, parallel movie sources to you and how you f as filmmakers can you can use it we have several internet portals in which we present our collections there are several of them because individual parts of the collection were digitalized and uh, made available in different years within the frames of different projects secondly currently the audiovisual institute um, it it was created out of two other institutions the national film archive and the, and the, they would like and the film institute they, we, they had huge archives and we were still working on this on these archives, we're working to, um, we want to present them all on one single internet portal, but you have to bear with us, it will work because they are still present in different websites. One of the oldest our, of our website, internet websites, is the photo archive, Fototeka. Fototeka, you can find, shows you the selection of our photographies. We have like huge materials which are related to film related, among others photos. In Fototeka you will find photos made on the, on the film on the film sets for marketing reasons. You will also find Vergs. Vergs were the shots made during the working on the set uh, it, and it shows behind the scenes of the film production. On the works, we see decorations, the, the set design, the uh, film crew during working on the film, also in during the breaks, some interesting, funny situation during the works. In Phototech, you will find also the photos from the castings, because that, and that's very interesting because it allows us which roles could have been played by different actors, which actors could have been set in different roles. And in Phototech, for example, you can find pictures of Daniel Odrycki for Farao. You can find there the first um, films of Piotr Frontowski, who as a 10-year boy was, was taking part in casting for the soldier of the Queen of Madagascar. You will find about half a million of the pictures there, and it's one of the portals in which we present this part of our collection. Gapla, 
is a gallery of, of film posters, all materials and iconographic materials from this uh, domain related mainly to the Polish cinematography. You can see here um, posters for Polish movies and international movies, but also Polish movies for international films. Here you can see the, the poster for um, Casablanca. You can, s you can get a lot of material there. You, uh, they're all described as long as <laughs> if we know we, we also include the name of the author, which is not so easy in terms of things that happened before the war. You can s find a lot of um, posters related to Polish cinematography. Another portal, uh, Repositorium Cyfrowe, is a website where you will find documentaries above all. You have scanned here the huge amounts of Polish um, uh, film chronicles, usually after the war, but there's also quite a lot of pre-war film chronicles. Almost half of our film chronicle is published on this website. All this material is very uh, um, uh, very f f diligently described. Uh, you can I also um, order such materials to be to be delivered to you. You can watch those materials on the on this website. More and more, you do not need to um, learn our about our collection in uh, on our uh, in our headquarters. You can see it online and see what sort of material would be useful for you. And then you can order for concrete film materials or fragments of materials. And the, the most important part is the Ninateka. We would not call we're now now called Fina, but Ninateka was is the remnant from the name of one of the institutions which uh, merged the National mm, Film uh, Institute. The address and the name remain the same so far. Ninateka is a gigantic source of all sorts of materials. We have feature films, we have documentaries, we have animated movies, uh, mm, spectacles, uh, a very... Um, we have sub-collections of, of different things, retro kino. You can see the, the two on us, I've the film I told you about, the one which has uh, French and Dutch um, subtitles, you can see it in Ninateka. The second other sub-collection is <coughs> the uh, theater of TV, TV, TV theater. You have concerts, you, have other, you can spend half of your life in Ninateka and you will not be able to see everything that is there. So that's another portal in which you can see material which can be somehow useful to you. Unfortunately, when you're using the archive material, both the contemporary ones and the old ones, you have to take into account the copyright and the licensing rights. And we as the uh, Ninateka, uh, uh, we are standing on the guard of such materials. So if you're interested in such materials, we are there to help you to establish if such a material can be used, um, to what extent and on basing on which rights we can get you in contact with heirs and establish the legal status of such things. So if you have any questions related to that material available on the on our website, you please get in touch with us under this address, hopefully. Mm. The, the colleagues will lead you through this collection, the whole process of uh, ordering this material, and will allow you to, to I will tell you what you can be able to do with those materials. I would like to encourage you to use our collection. It's a very rich collection. It's a very interesting collection and above all very useful for many different reasons and for many different uses because you can find there absolutely everything. Thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions, I will be glad to answer. I have one question. Following this last motive, do you remember such projects in recent years that used in contemporary audiovisual works, your archives, just to give you an example how they can come to existence. I do not deal with contemporary productions, 
but I know that fragments of several pre-war movies and the fragments of graphical image of the sound uh, track were used in Janek Młynarski's production. If you look the, uh, if you find the uh, musical video to Are You Dancing Rumba, it includes uh, some of the materials from um, from our archive. But all they also use in the documentaries, features. I don't remember the title, but there was a documentary film about the life of Jan Drefa, and it also used the fragments of the movies from our ar archive. So there are a number of productions about which use that. And I hope it will be more thanks to you. I have a question, you know, because we know the movies, okay, but using something for musical videos, maybe some interviews that could be used as a narrative and and the video impression. Are there free license or? Uh, it, it depends, it all depends. It depends on many different factors because not even all international, uh, sorry, pre-war films are in public domain. So you have to learn about every single material. You have to learn wha what's the legal situation. And if it's not so that the, let's say that, uh, that um, the features are belong to someone and the feature movie and the, and the movies are bi are free in free in public domain it's not so we are there to establish this and many people have it set and they don't have it set we're there to set it for you to establish this for you so if you need a mat any material like that you have to ask about it The ones that are set, do, do, is there no info on the website? You have to ask. Some of them, I mean, on the Phototeca website, you can read the, the copyright about the copyright about the to the photo, and then you can sort of get your uh, get a general idea who you will have to contact, right? In relation to that, in terms of films, sometimes it's on our website, but not always. But it, if it's not there, what is the status of the movie? Then you have to ask. But if it is. Then it's, it's a hint. Is there an index which allows you to to search? For example, let's say we have a we have a documentary about Drefa. Yes, there is an index, but you have to find this person it, in each of those portals individually. We're just working right now all on one single website in which each of the materials will be presented. But please believe me, these are millions of photographies hundreds of thousands of movies and such huge amount of materials that you won't do it just like that. We have to make a gigantic portal and we've been working on it for a long time, but still it will take some time. I wasn't here from the very outset, so maybe you said that when you're technically correcting a part of the movie, what is the procedure? Because there's somebody who's marking this on the file. Do you there's there's blemish, there's damage. What is the workflow? Well, first, the whole material is being reviewed just to get some general idea. What What is the scale of the problem that we have to deal with and what will be done, what has to be done in that film? And unfortunately, and, and the problem is also how much time we have to work on this film because you can always do something more. It's a bit like with uh, um, correcting the, f the photo in some sort of graphical uh, um, software. But the film is like not one picture, it's several hundred thousand pictures, so you can work it on three weeks on, on a single picture and you can work on a movie for 10 years and there'll be still work to be done. But so initially we have to set certain framework, so certain frames and, and limits that let's say we stabilize the image, we, let, we try to we do remove the, the, the scratches, but we're not uh, removing small blemishes because there's no time for that. Uh, you always walk, walk through the material and you judge your 
possibilities, both human possibilities and the financial ones. And you create a plan to which extent we will be working on the movie. Do you know how many uh, pre-war films were made for re reconstruction? More or less, yes. Mm. But pre-war restored feature films so far we had 25 and all of them we have about 170 170 so we, we were in front of before us. there are like 150 before us unfortunately not all of them are complete so let's we don't know how to count that if we talk about documentary documentaries pre-war we have 400 of them and at unfortunately only some of them are in a restored uh, res digitally restored form many of them unfortunately i don't know how many they're just scanned in exactly as they are they were not restored digitally they were not improved they were just scanned one to one they put on the repository or digital re repository website you can watch them but it's not the ideal shape that we would like them to reach but we can't do everything at once of course so there are there is about 170 feature films still 150 to go documental documentaries 400 to go and and we have about 100 pre-war chronicles and that's a very complicated thing and very difficult to count because many of them are chronicles which are incomplete or co collections also amalgamations of different producers different uh, shots different um, materials so it's very difficult to judge where do you find copies with the romanian uh, subtitles well th there were two there was there were two films uh, with we've just found them in bucharest in 1967 there's something called FIAF, International Federation of Film Archives. Within this federation, the archives are cooperating. They inform each other which sort of films they're looking for, which films they identify in the archives. So we're in constant contact with one another. And within that, within frames of this cooperation, different things are happening and they are being found. And apart from that, thankfully, still from time to time, something is being found in private hands. And a few years ago, mm, here in Krakow, during the uh, restoration of one of the of the buildings, one of the gentlemen found some films, and he uh, referred to us thankfully, and he found a film, a film Kościuszko on a Transwapicy battle, one of the third m oldest uh, surviving Polish movie, 1913. Not in the or original version. It's one of the, it, but, but still, you know, it's one of the oldest m film materials, and we found it during the restoration of a house, refurbishment of a house. So different conditions, different situations. Thankfully, there are still, and of course, Janka Muzyka. We have to finish, but if you could uh, quickly say, tell this story, yes, because it's a crazy story. So, six years ago. In in Fort Zenon Festival, we showed Janek Muzykan, but it was not the, the restored, digitally restored film, but the, the later show copy from our show reel from our. But uh, people were crazy about this film all around the world. People were talking about that. Everybody was crazy about Janek Muzykan. There was a lot of media attention around it, and half of the archive world was talking about that. And thanks to that, we've managed to find something incredible. Janko Muzykan is one of the first Polish um, music movies with sound. Unfortunately, the, the soundtrack for this film disappeared and for the several dozen years uh, the film was known only af uh, was known without the sound. And we've managed to find the original sound to Janek Janko Muzykan in private collection in Italy. We brought that to Poland. We just finished the uh, digital restoration. And in one and a half weeks, we will show Janek Muzykan for the first time after the war with the sound in the sound version with the original soundtrack. So such developments such uh, um, adventures also take place so if you will be in Warsaw next time within the frames of the 
of the Feast of uh, Silent Cinema, we will show Janko Muzykant. It's an, it's of course it's a voiced film, but it's it's from an interesting part when it's it's all it all has, it um, it still has sound which is the original sound, but without the dialogues, with the planches. And we'll show it du during that uh, event. Th sorry that I mean I'm doing I'm working with the film music. This uh, soundtrack was found in Shadak um, uh, plates, which are which is more brittle than glass. So well, it's incredible that they survived their times. And they're all they're complete and they're in such a good uh, condition. <coughs> That's more than a miracle. So, referring to the sound, what does it look like in with silent films? This film was not recorded in the show show copies. Some film is some uh, sound is added. Yes, it's a musical illustration written especially for the films. Also, in the 1920s, there was a special music for the movies, and together it was distributed. The, the, they dis distributed a score for the music that or orchestra that played, but there was singular things it referred only to super productions like Petropolis or like big movies uh, and in absolute majority of the cases this this music was improvised in the cinema uh, by tappers not many movies had music especially for this like Metropolis used the, the score from uh, the 1920s and and the contemporary orchestra played that original score. Right now, usually, a new music is in uh, for that film made from this. I wanted to ask about pre-war um, radio recordings or sports. Or um, well, they are in the archives of the Polish radio. We are not the radio archives. When it comes to sports features, we have that a bit a bit of that in the film chronicles, but they are only film archives. If you want to have radio mm, uh, programs, not many pre-war uh, mm, radio s programs were um, uh, retained or survived after the war, but they recorded on a like special mm, special plates, which are the special mm, uh, discs, and many of them were not digitalized. It's a, uh, there is a collection for that in the Polish radio, but unfortunately, it's not available yet. Yes, uh, yes, of course. The with within the film w and the film archives, do they include the uh, interwar period? Yes. The oldest version that we have is the French one. Is the relation from the 500th uh, anniversary of uh, Battle of Grunwald? There was a mm, uh, a big uh, d um, like a mm, event here. It was recorded by a French correspondent. When it comes to Polish productions, the oldest ones are two features from Czesachowa from 1930. One is the uh, a feature from the fire of the of the matches factory, because uh, it's incredible that a cameraman with the with his camera full of of flammable tape went among the the the, the still burning re left remains of the match factory. If there are no more questions, thank you very much. Thank you, and I would like to invite you to use our um, resources.